Hello, my friends, and welcome to the Robcast. And uh, this episode is part three of uh, Alternative Wisdom, and this one is called An Introduction to Punk Wisdom. And uh, yeah, we're going to cover all sorts of ground. Um, so uh, it's my daughter's birthday this weekend. She's turning eight, so we have a unicorn pinata on the premises. The unicorn pinata may actually be tied up into the ceiling of the back house. So uh, that's the level of greatness that we are aspiring to <laughs> this weekend. Oh, and um, I'm about to go to her class. And you know how you take treats in on your kid's birthday? And I wrote this kid's story for her recently about a guy named Don who has a goat and a guy named Ron who has a boat. Don had a goat and Ron had a boat. And Ron used to roll around in his boat and gloat and say, I'm in a boat, Don, and you're on land. I bet you can't stand it that I'm in my boat and you're on your land with your goat. Who wants a goat when you could have a boat? <laughs> I have it right in front of me because I'm about to, she wants me to read it to her class. <laughs> and I'm, I have this feeling that, and then it's this whole story about what happens. By the way, the goat, its name is Randy. And its last name is Dandy. And it gets Sandy standing there on the shore, but Don can't take anymore. <laughs> so literally, I am about to print out this story about Don had a goat and Ron had a boat. And uh, the story is called A Goat for a Boat, because they end up trading the boat for the goat. And then Ron finds out that the boat has a leak. It's made of teak, and there's a leak in the teak. And now he has water on his seat. And... Uh, he finds out that he's been burned, that Don is actually a con, that Ron is actually a con. And uh, <laughs> I don't know why I'm telling you about this, but it makes me laugh because I'm in full this story mode because I'm about to go over to her school and read it to her class. And I'm telling you, it could be crickets. They all could look at me like, what is this story about? So that's what we got going on. And a lizard just came in the back house. So uh, here, lizard, lizard, there is a, where is it? There is a small lizard at my feet that apparently it's looking for spiritual direction. So uh, we'll take it. We welcome everybody. We're an all-inclusive podcast. And uh, in other news, oh, we released a trailer this week for my new book, What is the Bible? Que es la Biblia? And uh, the trailer, it's a very official book trailer, and it's on YouTube, and it's on my Facebook page. And I hope that it makes you laugh. And obviously it's a book trailer, so I hope it makes you get the book. <laughs> Because that's how those things work. And um, if you want to pre-order the book and get some bonus content, that's at my site. Um, the audio book is going to come out when the book comes out. And then um, there's going to be a bookstore tour. And uh, maybe I'm coming your way. And all that info is at my site, including, a, I think, a couple of the cities had tickets that sold out. But we're adding, uh, I think I'm going to do the talk twice in a couple of cities because the first um, round of tickets sold out right away. So we got that stuff going on. But today I want to talk about punk wisdom. And I'm assuming you have no idea what I'm talking about, which is, of course, uh, the way I'd like it. Because I want to introduce you to a way of thinking about wisdom and a way of thinking about alternative wisdom that um, has helped me so much navigate so many things and explain so many things. And so first I want to show you three movements within wisdom, three sort of developmental stages, and then at the end I want to explore the spiritual implications of this. So first I just want to show you some things developmentally, then uh, at the end, I just want to spend a moment and explore the spiritual implications of this because I think you're going you're gonna to find yourself thinking, oh, uh, so that's what was going on there. So if you have like, uh, if you're th thinking about this uh, graphically or visually, or if you have pen and paper and you take notes on these sort of things, I want to talk about, show you pre-conventional wisdom, conventional wisdom, and then post conventional wisdom. So on the left-hand side, right, pre-conventional, then an arrow pointing to the right, then in the middle, conventional wisdom, and then an arrow from conventional wisdom pointing right to post-conventional wisdom. And I have my notes, of course, written on paper in a notebook. So, um, and we've got about two pages of outline here, so 
Well, we'll see where this takes us. Now, pre-conventional wisdom, let's start there. Pre-conventional wisdom is the two-year-old who says no, or the three-year-old whose favorite phrase is uh-uh, no, never, who folds their arms over their chest and refuses to do what you're asking them to do. Pre-conventional wisdom is unaware that there is a way things are properly done. Pre-conventional wisdom refuses to conform to the norm. Pre-conventional wisdom stands at a distance and refuses to play by the rules. And every parent knows pre-conventional wisdom. Pre-conventional wisdom, if you are trying to get somebody to do something or simply introduce them to a better way of being that doesn't make you completely crazy, pre-conventional wisdom is no, mm -mm. nope, nope. It stands at a distance, it shakes its fist, it stomps its feet, it throws food, it rubs peanut butter in its hair. Um, this, of course, doesn't apply just to kids. We'll get to that in a minute, but that's pre-conventional wisdom. Now, conventional wisdom is the rules. It's the way it's done. It's how things work. It's how they operate. It's how we've agreed upon proper conduct and behavior. Sometimes conventional wisdom is spoken and outlined and written out. Sometimes there's a list on the wall of rules about how it works. Sometimes conventional wisdom is not. It's just what you pick up in the tribe about how we do things. Conventional wisdom is sometimes the establishment, the tradition, the policy, the group, the group think, the party line. Conventional wisdom is the way that we do it. So let's go back to parenting. When you are teaching your kid to make their bed and you are saying things like, we make our beds in the morning, or perhaps you have junior high, or high, junior high students and you're like, hey, we take showers around here more than once every two weeks. <laughs> or before we go to bed in the morning, we brush our teeth. Uh, what you are doing is you are helping your child move from pre-conventional wisdom to conventional wisdom. You're essentially saying there's a way that we can conduct ourselves. There's a way that we care for ourselves. There's a way that we behave, and here is how it works. Uh, I remember when my boys were young, teaching them how to shake hands with people when they meet people, and that when you meet people, you shake them in their hand, you, sh you shake their hand, you look them in the eye, and you say their name. I remember like literally in the backyard, like having them act it out because we'd been in a number of situations where they would like look away or they didn't know what to do when somebody stuck out their hand. And so it was basic like, here's how we do it. You think about grammar, how to hold a pencil, how to take out the trash, how to stand in line and not cut, um, how to drive and navigate roads. This is all what a parent is doing in helping a child move from pre-conventional to conventional wisdom. Now, this leads us to post-conventional wisdom because sometimes the group think is totally whacked. Sometimes the way that everybody does it is way out of bounds and everybody's lost their minds and you have to swim upstream. So sometimes with your kid, what you're teaching your kid how to do is challenge the norms. Like think about those phrases like peer pressure and swimming upstream. And sometimes everybody's gonna go do that, but you have to go the other direction. And then sometimes with your kid, and uh, Kristen and I did this whole thing on being a parent called launching rockets. Um, sometimes with your kid, you're both teaching them how things are done and helping invite them into conventional wisdom from pre-conventional wisdom. And at the exact same moment in another dimension of life, you're teaching them about conventional wisdom. Sometimes you're saying, here are the rules. And in the exact same moment, you're also saying to them, I know everybody says this is the rule, but you got to break that rule because it's a lame rule. Sometimes you're saying to them, this is how we do things. 
and you're also teaching them when everybody says, well, this is what everybody does. No, it's not what you do. And so you resist the conventional wisdom, not from a pre-conventional state of awareness, but from a post-conventional state of awareness. Pre-conventional wisdom, conventional wisdom, post-conventional wisdom. Now, a couple thoughts about this. One, regarding rules. To break the rules, you first need to learn the rules. This is true in art, business, academics. This is true in many, many disciplines, trades, crafts, art forms, and relationships and way of interacting with people. So uh, Malcolm Gladwell sort of introduced this idea of the 10,000 hours. Often, the way that it works is you have to learn the conventional wisdom of whatever it is that you're doing. You have to put in your 10,000 hours. You have to start out in the mail room. You have to be mentored. You have to learn how it's done. So uh, sometimes I'll meet people. This happened again this week. I'll meet people who say, hey, I want to do what you do. Uh, or I'll meet somebody who says, you know what, I'm just not a nine to five guy. I just kind of want to hang out and do the kind of stuff that you do. Guess how it started for me? It started by working nine to five. Actually, it wasn't nine to five. It was like eight to 10 or whatever it was. Uh, you talk to anybody who's doing interesting work in the world and you trace their story back and you will find, I guarantee you, some time and place when they learned the conventional wisdom about whatever it is they're doing. Because you have to learn the rules in order to break them. Uh, Alexander McQueen it, uh, was this brilliant designer. He took his own life a little while ago. Uh, his flagship store, one of his main stores is uh, near my house here in LA. And uh, Alexander McQueen was like this unbelievable avant-garde designer. Some of the stuff that he made uh, is just incredible. But if you read his biography, he was from a rough part of London, and in high school, he interned and he apprenticed at a store on Savile Row, um, which was the store that made formal suits for the royal family. So this kind of wild uh, sort of urban kid went to work in this very staid, formal, traditional British clothes uh, place where they make custom clothing for very, very wealthy people. And uh, in his biography, you learn about how he was given a set of shears, not scissors, shears. And the first thing is you learn how to cut fabric. Um, and what's so fascinating is the story is about all of the groundbreaking things he's done to sort of shatter people's conventions about what is style and uh, what is possible with clothing. But when you read his story, what does it begin with? He learns the conventional wisdom of how to make a suit. Um, so he's making stuff later with skulls on it, and he's making stuff with uh, like feathers, and he's doing, but how did he begin? He began by making suits for older British gentlemen. You want to be dangerous? You want to be radical? You want to forge some new path? You want to be an innovator? You have to start with what is conventional wisdom here. How do people do it in this marketplace? How do people raise kids here? You learn that so that you can subvert it, you can resist it, you can move beyond it. Now, let's go back and talk about conventional wisdom. Some conventional wisdom is conventional because it's good, because it's necessary, because the reason why it's conventional wisdom is because it keeps us safe, it keeps us healthy, it keeps food on our plates, and it's good. So part of maturity and part of understanding alternative wisdom is understanding sometimes it's conventional because the convention is good. Case in point, seat belts. Seat belts, what we know from statistically is that a seat belt saves lives. That was even a, a slogan for a while. Um, so when people are like, I don't need, I'm moving to post-conventional, I'm challenging the group think, I don't need a I don't need a conventional. Great. We, we'll, we'll tell good stories about you at your funeral. Do you know what I mean? Or for example, a spreadsheet. Uh, maybe you're like, I don't need to keep accurate accounting. We're just sort of going with the muse, listening to the spirit. Just seeing. Yeah. Well, what's also interesting is if you have some money in the bank, 
you tend to be able to follow the spirit and listen to the muse a little more closely because your stomach isn't grumbling because you don't have money for food. <laughs> Are you with me now? Raise your glasses. So good. So sometimes conventional wisdom is there for a reason. And, and everybody does it this way because it's the best way to do it. So for example, conventional wisdom is um, discipline is valuable. Yes, discipline is. Sometimes it's like, you know, hard work creates opportunities. That's a conventional wisdom. Yeah, why is that conventional wisdom? Because hard work often does create opportunities. Now, in a future episodes, we're gonna talk about what happens uh, in, with the utter failure of any form of wisdom. We're talking about the wisdom after wisdom. But right now, let's stay here with conventional wisdom. Part of maturity is understanding sometimes that if you're rebelling against everything, from a pre or a post conventional standpoint, you sometimes, if you just have a blanket, well, if everybody does it, then I'm against it. Sometimes that may be a recipe for being an idiot. You may be in your resistance resisting against something that's actually good and helpful and true and necessary. Now, let's move from pre to conventional to post conventional. Post conventional wisdom transcends conventional wisdom. It moves beyond it, but it includes it at the same time. Post conventional wisdom is when you have moved beyond the group think accepted wisdom, not because you have rejected it, but because you have included and integrated all of the good of it. You're just leaving behind certain elements of it that no longer serve you or whatever it is that you are doing well. It takes the best of conventional wisdom and it keeps going. See, pre-conventional wisdom is ignorance. It hasn't done the hard work of even learning what conventional wisdom is. Pre-conventional wisdom is rooted in ignorance. Post-conventional wisdom is rooted in integration. So you may be challenging the group think, not because you're against conventional wisdom, but because you've gone through conventional wisdom and it failed you in certain ways, and so you had to keep going, but you have integrated all that in conventional wisdom that was worth keeping. You're still wearing a seatbelt. Make sense? Now, let's take it a step farther. Because sometimes, and here's the twist, sometimes pre-conventional wisdom and post-conventional wisdom look very similar because they both seem to be resisting the way everybody does it. They may be using similar language, similar forms, similar systems, similar symbols, but they are actually coming from two very different developmental states. By the way, integral theorists call this the pre-post fallacy. Here's an example. Years ago, I went to an anti-war uh, rally. It was the height of the Iraq war. George W. Bush was speaking about a quarter mile from my house. He was speaking in my neighborhood, and this massive crowd gathered, like thousands of people lining the streets. And by the way, they were lining the streets because they thought that when he was done, he would have to drive through them and they could yell and all that. But actually, it turns out the Secret Service just had him drive away a different direction. <laughs> and some of the Secret Service came out and stood there like he was about to drive by. So the crowd got, crowd got really fired up. And then he just drove out a different entrance, which I thought was like Secret Service, like fair play to you. You know what I mean? Because you know they were smiling behind those sunglasses, behind that poker face, because they were like, this crowd has no idea that they are waiting for something that's not going to happen. Nevertheless, I was deeply troubled and against the war, and I thought this would be interesting to sort of observe this. And here's what's fascinating. I'm walking through the crowd, and I began to pick up two very different energies that were present in the same event. What's really interesting is as I walked through the crowd, some people seemed to be there out of sheer unadulterated rage for anybody in a suit. Do you know what I mean? 
It was just pure hatred of institutions, government, anything. Um, it was anti anybody anywhere who has power, basically, was what it felt like. That was sort of the air was, you're the establishment, we are against the establishment, period, fist raised. Now, I realize I'm generalizing, but stay with me here because we'll go somewhere else. Now, there was also a different spirit among some of the protesters, which was this war raises profound questions about cycles of violence, about the myth of redemptive violence, about the proper use of military power, about use of taxpayers' money, about certain advisors to the president who have interests in the industrial military complex, the costs of this war. At some point, it was like $10 billion a month or something. And what we could do around the world with this money besides dropping bombs on people. Um, it had questions about imposing democracy on cultures that might need developmentally a few steps before open election. It had, it was a reasoned, thoughtful, this doesn't fit the criteria of just war. Um, we rushed into this without, we haven't found weapons of mass destruction. There is no tie between the regime in Iraq and Al-Qaeda and 9-11. Like you had thoughtful, reasoned, deep spiritual reflection leading people to say, we have to stand up and say, this is a problem and we are resisting it. So what's fascinating is you had people there from a pre-conventional wisdom perspective, stage of consciousness, and you also had people there from a post-conventional stage of consciousness. And they were both in the same place. So sometimes with wisdom, you may have a similarity of form, but people are animated by very different spirits. Sometimes it is pre-conventional, irrational spirit that is just the spirit of rage, anger, and unadulterated resistance. And sometimes the spirit is a thoughtful, compassionate, integrated, whole view of the world that causes the person to be at the same rally, participating for very different reasons and participating perhaps in resisting something that should be resisted, but from very different stages. Now, all that said, let's explore the spiritual dimensions of this. Because the spiritual implications, of course, are endless. When the conventional wisdom of your tribe no longer works for you, and you begin to step outside of that and live with a different compass, you might find yourself experiencing deep loneliness. So uh, you think about the Jesus tradition. When Jesus says, you have heard it said, but I tell you. When you think about alternative wisdom, uh, what you are witnessing is post-conventional wisdom. I know everybody says this is how it works, but I'm telling you this is how it works. I know everybody is playing the game, trying to prove their worth, including lots of religious activity to prove your worth, but God isn't playing the game. It's an invitation to post-conventional wisdom. It's not because you have turned your back on the tribe, it's because you had to keep going. You had to leave, not out of anger, hatred. You had to leave because you began to realize that the conventional wisdom wasn't big, wide, integrated, compassionate, whole enough for where you were headed. And this is true for business. It's true in art. It's true in spirituality. It's true in academia. It's true in healthcare. It's true for tribes. It's true for long held customs. It's that moment 
when the conventional wisdom is no longer up for the task that is before you. You have a work to do. You have calling. You have something you're here to do to participate in the ongoing creation of the world. And the thing that you're doing can't fit in those boxes anymore. Now, I want to speak to those of you who were raised in a tribe and you no longer buy some of the conventional wisdom of your tribe. And I often meet people who are angry with their tribe of origin. They're angry with their mentors. They're angry with family. They're angry with uh, the place that trained them. They're angry with the church. They're angry with the government. They're angry with whoever it is that used to tell them this is how it works and this is how we do things. Here's the thing. You have to understand that making peace with conventional wisdom is absolutely essential for your ongoing growth. And so the move is to ask, was there any good in there? And what you do is, I'm leaving some things behind, but I'm also realizing that some of that conventional wisdom shaped me. Maybe I learned the idea of right and wrong. So maybe now you have a different sense of right and wrong, but you did learn the idea. Sometimes what happens is conventional wisdom gave you a moral compass, and now you kept going, but it actually, maybe conventional wisdom taught you discipline. Maybe conventional wisdom taught you impulse control. We don't always just give in to everything we want in the moment. Maybe impulse, maybe conventional wisdom taught you postpone gratification. It introduced you to a number of things that helped shape you. And so you begin to see it developmentally. That worked on for me for a while. It helped me, and then I had to keep going. So whenever I meet somebody who's upset about their whatever upbringing or whatever they're training, I just say to them, name one good thing you got out of it. Nothing. Really? Nothing? Nothing at all. Did you learn math? Well, yeah, yeah, I learned math. Did you learn that the, uh, of the idea of good versus evil or right versus wrong? Well, yeah, they talked about it all the time. Okay, so you were given that concept. Yeah. Are you grateful that you have some sense of moral compass, some sense of justice, some sense of... Yeah, of course I am. Great. You see what I mean? When you move to post-conventional wisdom, to move there in health and integration is to make peace with, yeah, a bunch of that didn't work and I'm going to have to leave it behind and some of it was downright abusive or maybe for you it was just all a giant train wreck. You still begin with, is there anything that worked on me? So for example, puberty. How many of you went through puberty? Excellent. 100% show of hands. So good. Are you against puberty? Do you wish you wouldn't have gone through puberty? Do you want to go through puberty now? No, thank God. Right. A little wobbly in there. Would you agree? So uh, puberty worked on you for a while, and then thank God you kept going. But you're not angry with puberty. You don't want to go back there, but you're not angry with it. You've made peace with it. You wouldn't be you today without those awkward years when you went through puberty. So you can see the developmental move is similar when you find that the group think, the language and customs of the tribe, the conventional wisdom, you're moving beyond it. Central to your health and joy is making peace with where you're coming from. There was a section of town when I was growing up where like lots of people in their uh, 20s would live and there were all these old houses that like 10 people would rent and uh, it was this was like like what late 80s and there were all these like people in their 20s um, who would like be playing hacky sack out in the front yard with like long hair listening to all sorts of interesting music and I remember we would drive through that part of town and my dad would always say under his breath all the hippies have straight teeth <laughs> I don't even think he realized how funny and weirdly profound that is. All the hippies have straight teeth. And essentially what he was saying is all these people who are sort of doing their own thing, rebelling against the man, raging against the machine, they all have straight teeth because somebody somewhere paid for their braces. <laughs> that was his perspective. Uh, <laughs> You see what I mean? It's like uh, the, everybody's free here to kind of just go with the flow because they were given food 
and education and piano lessons and taken to the orthodontist. <laughs> now, let's go back to the spiritual implications of this. The mystics, the saints, the innovators, the prophets, the wayfinders, the martyrs, the gurus, the yogis, generally the enlightened ones are speaking to you of an alternative wisdom. That's why you're drawn to them. And the reason why they often have such profound insight and love and compassion and wisdom and can show you the path so well is because there was a moment when they moved beyond conventional wisdom. And generally there will be no movement beyond conventional wisdom. There will be no transcending including without some sort of cost. Often it will appear to conventional wisdom like you've lost your mind, like you're turning your back, like you have left the faith, like you have betrayed the tradition. And that hurts, and there's loneliness, and sometimes there's misunderstanding. And so in generally every tradition in human history, the great ones who open your eyes to whole new levels of insight and consciousness are people who went through this process. They went through the dark night of the soul. They, they headed out into the woods. They left the safety of the village. They went on the hero's journey because they couldn't stay in the village because the thing that was happening to them was bigger than the village. Yeah. And by the way, this is often why the people who can help lead you into the post-conventional landscape often speak in parables, often speak in stories, often speak in hints. They often invite you to practices, rituals, rites. They often invite you to sit. They tell you a riddle. They craft things in terms of a poem. There's lots of money, speaking of cost, there's lots of money to be made in conventional wisdom, repeating and parroting and reminding and enforcing and protecting and preserving groupthink, how we do it, how it's done the proper way. Think about business. Think about how much energy and business is spent protecting the institution, the business, the market, from the disruptions because investors don't like disruptions. disruptions. They like up and to the right. Did we make more money last month than the month before it? That's often the driving question. And when you begin to realize, wait, I think there's a whole new way to do this. I think this industry is begging to be disrupted. I think our customers actually despise some of our practices. I think they're actually in the way of giving people a good service. You begin to think like that, lots of money is made keeping conventional wisdom as the center of gravity. Businesses, and here's why, businesses, families, towns, political parties, extended families, churches, denominations, networks generally have a center of gravity of consciousness generally have a center of gravity of this is how it works. And when that center of gravity no longer holds for you like it used to, it will be very difficult for you to stay true to your path without some form of disruption and departure. And there will generally always be a cost. Now, obviously, the dominant paradigms and understandings in business, art, academia, spirituality don't talk much about this because if they talked about this, it would undermine the very stability of the whole thing. How many of you have been a part of something where someone said, could we please just not have any more controversy? Which essentially is, could we please just freeze it how it is? But the very nature of life is movement. The universe is an end, is an endless state of becoming. The whole thing is dynamic to its bones. 
And so when you find yourself thinking, there's got to be some better way to do this, or maybe you're a, a mom and you're on the playground and you're react, interacting with the other moms and you're like, I cannot do this for one more day. Everybody has agreed that this is how you give your kid the best. And I don't think that that's actually, I think it's going to kill my kid. I think my kid just wants to play in the sand. I think my kid just wants to play Legos. I don't think my kid needs to know Russian for their brain development before they're six. You know what I'm saying? You do that, there will probably be a cost. This is why the great ones are always limping. They're limping because they've had to pay a cost. And trust me on this, I know of what I speak. But the life is found when you keep going. Punk rock has its origins in pre-conventional wisdom. Just give a finger to the man. Just, and actually a lot of rock music has, as a genre, has its, uh, it has its roots in rebelling against the system, in resisting the man, in standing up, in raging against the machine. Uh, so there is a pre-conventional punk that is just angry with anybody in a suit, that's angry with anybody who has their hand on the wheel. Uh, but, but you could also think about punk as post-conventional punk. It's like, there's a wise punk who's seen it, who's done the 10,000 hours, who's learned the rules, who got the moral compass, the impulse control, who, who went through conventional wisdom and came out the other side. And so you have the punk spirit. You have the resistance. You have the spine. You have the, I'm going to swim upstream. And actually I'm finding some other people were swimming upstream together. Uh, we're challenging unfettered 21st century capitalism that leaves millions of people behind. We are challenging this consumerism that leaves landfills filled with plastic things that we only used for a couple of minutes and is ripping our earth to shreds. We are challenging the ways in which women have been held down and oppressed and work the same job but don't get paid the same amount as a man. You, you know what I'm talking about here. Part of spiritual maturity and part of alternative wisdom is keeping your inner punk alive. And maybe you and your partner are living in some setting where everybody's like, this is how we do it. This is how you climb. This is how you achieve. This is how you accumulate. Maybe you're raising kids. Maybe you're thinking about retirement and everybody's like, well, this is what we do. We sort of, and you're like, no, no, I know that's what everybody does, but I got something else in me. I got something burning in me. And so what you do, my brothers and sisters, is you keep that inner punk alive. Not from the unawareness, the cluelessness, and the immaturity of pre-conventional wisdom, but from the wisdom, wholeness, integration, and health of post-conventional wisdom. Some things we resist because they need to be resist, and some things we embrace because they're the only way forward. And sometimes we think, I have heard it said, but I tell you, it's something else. Yes. There you go, my friends. I can't even tell you how much fun it was to do this episode. Pre-conventional, conventional, and post-conventional wisdom. May you, my friends, embrace your inner punk. May you come to see the power and vitality of punk post-conventional wisdom. And may you in those moments when you realize, oh, I'm gonna have to venture off into the woods and step away from the tribe, may you be reminded that you're not the first, that this is how the true spiritual path always unfolds. And may you experience abundant, overwhelming, overflowing life. And may grace and peace be with you every step of the way.